We are uh, going to continue the conversation right now uh, with Mary Barra, uh, a name everybody here knows. Uh, she is the CEO of General Motors. She is just finishing up her first year as CEO of uh, that company, the first woman to hold that job. Um, I can't even begin to imagine what we might talk about. Mary, come on out. Thank you so much for being here. Sure, thank you. Thank you. She came here in a Cadillac uh, Escalade, everybody. Just wanted to make yes. sure everybody knew that it was uh, on brand uh, for Mary this morning. Um, yeah, so I said it's been you know, a very quiet year for you to start this, this job. Nothing's really happened. You've just been hanging out. Uh, we've had a, a few things. A few things happened. A couple we've things happened. Yeah, right. um, you spent your entire career uh, at, at GM, and I just sort of because we, we read about this company and, and its travails over the past year a lot. I just uh, thought I'd, I'd start by just saying, when, when do you think it sunk in for you as somebody who's been a lifer at the company that something happened culturally, that something changed that needed now to be fixed? Well, you know, at, at General Motors, as you said, I've been there over 30 years, and there's been a lot of change made to, to you know, work on cultural issues and, you know, really change behaviors. But I think as we looked at this specific, specific situation, it was truly tragic. And, you know, we had a, again, you know, a face it, do the right thing, face it head on. And it did cause us to look at some things and say, how do we break down barriers? How do we, you know, truly drive accountability? And how do we do the right thing? So, but from a lesson perspective, was there a, what was like the worst day of the last year? Was there like a moment in all of this? Uh, I mean, there, there was, it wasn't a worst day, it was a worst period. Uh, because again, it was, uh, it was a tragic situation and, you know, as it unfolded and you learned more because it was, it was you know, happening in real time as, as we learned it and we had to deal with it. But, uh, you know, I think, it really, um, one of the things we did last year in the company is we changed the values, and we changed the values to three things. We're gonna focus on the customer, put the customer in the center of everything we do, relationships matter, and excellence. And so as, as we you know, started to look at this, it became very clear we were gonna deal with this directly, and we were going to demonstrate our values. Right. But what was it, the, the, I, I'm just trying to understand, when you think about it, to the extent that you were going to go teach this as a case study, in the future, mm -hmm. and to try to understand what went wrong. What was the thing that you think went wrong? When, and when do you think you figured out what that was? I think looking at, you know, a, at General Motors, big company, but we basically do one thing. We build cars, trucks, and crossovers, so we design and engineer them. And looking at the importance of working across silos, because if one piece of the organization has a uh, piece of information, the other needs it, you know, you need to have that uh, working across, and and I th so to me that was the biggest. We have to fix that. We can't let pockets of the organization. We uh, we we have to focus all together, and we have to constantly be thinking about what's in the best interest of the customer. What's going to create value for the customer? Or in this case, I'm, what's going to fix When do you it? think that was lost? I mean, what what do you think it was to the extent that this was a company that had success for many many years? Was it the bankruptcy process that did people take their eyes off the? But what was the thing? I'm, I'm just trying to understand, yeah. there's, there's some CEOs and other people in management here who, we're all trying to understand when you're looking at a company that's, that's had a crisis, mm -hmm. what was the thing that, that had, you, had with, with hindsight, you could say, you know, we, we just but, needed to get on that earlier. I, I mean, beyond the obvious. It, I don't think you can go back and look in, in the history and say it was that thing. I think, uh, you know, as the company, as the company grew and, and we went through different experiences that we have over the last decade. I, I think it was a gradual thing, which I think is the thing that you have to look out for because it's the more insidious, because it's not something that happens like that and you went, hmm, is this good or bad? It's something that sneaks up on you or is gradual. And so you have to constantly be challenging yourself in the organization is, do I have the right connectivity? Do I have the right structure? Am I driving the importance? But that's why I think it gets back to values because you can't fix that type of thing with an org structure or lines on a piece of paper or processes. You have to fix it by everybody looking to do the right thing for the customer, having those values and having that alignment and feeling true accountability. Right. Um, you have been uh, very visible and very public since all of this. 
um, which, by the way, is a, an approach that not everyone has taken over the years. And so I want to try to understand the lesson about that. Was that something that you wanted to do immediately? Lawyers usually tell you not to. I'm thinking, by the way, Takata, which is in its own situation right now, you hear nothing uh, from them. Are they doing the right thing? Well, I, I, again, I, I don't think it's right for me to comment on them. I just looked from a company perspective. We had a responsibility. I'm the CEO. It stops with me. So uh, I represented the men and women of General Motors as we work through this issue to do the right thing. But, but, but I mean, did the lawyers come and say to you, you really, you shouldn't, we shouldn't? No, actually, no, they didn't. Uh, you know, Mike Milliken, who's our general counsel, is outstanding. I've known him for almost 20 years. And, you know, frankly, he was right, you know, there in the room supporting doing the right thing. And it, so I never had that counsel. Let me ask you a, a, a different question, really sort of moving on to where we are today. And we keep talking about oil. I don't want the whole day to be a conversation about oil prices, but I assume oil prices, if you're an automobile company, you're sitting there, you're watching these prices, and you're thinking to yourself, what? Well, I, I'm thinking, you know, it, it has uh, immediate term. It, it causes people to make different buying decisions. I mean, it gives them, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, more discretionary funds. But longer term, it doesn't change anything. Uh, you know, we're on a path. We're making investments for the long term, three, five, seven, and beyond of, uh, you know, fuel efficiency, of just the internal combustion engine, technologies we can do to improve that, electrification. You know, we have the next generation of the Volt coming out. We have, you know, significant work with our battery electric vehicles. So it really doesn't change anything because it, it's much broader than oil prices. When you look at why we need to have more efficient fuel economy, you know, the trends in the globe of, of more urbanization, and you look at some of the cities already, the congestion, you know, the environmental aspects, it, it doesn't change our direction as we do R&D and look at the product portfolio of the future at all. Where, where does the vault sort of place itself in, in, in this marketplace, especially given what's happening with oil prices, but also in a marketplace where people look at the Tesla up here and, and other hybrids and other things in, in different places. It seems to be sort of in the, how do you, how do you position that vehicle in well, the right place? I, you know, I think- uh, What is the right place? Well, when you look at the Volt, I mean, first of all, the customers of the Volt um, over the last, this first generation are incredibly loyal. They love the vehicle. I mean, if you go on and read the blogs, they're, they're talking about, you know, how they, they now go when they actually do fuel up. They only put three gallons in because uh, there's a situation on the Volt that if you don't use your gas uh, in enough time, well, the vehicle will force you because old gas is not good for the engine. So they, because they don't, because people, you know, when you look at the driving experience, 85% of the population in the United States drives less than 40 miles one way. So if you can plug in on both ends, you're always on electric power. And so I think the key thing, and as we roll out the next generation of the Volt, is to continue to provide the value as the battery costs go down, as the power density goes up in the battery. Um, it starts to be a value proposition that works for more and more people uh, at, at, at the base level Are of the market. Are you of the view, though, by the way, that oil prices slow, that, slow, slow the adoption of these vehicles? Uh, I, again, I, I think the customer is incredibly rational. I think they're going to look at their situation, their value proposition, their specific use case, and make that decision. I mean, there's some people who uh, will will make the decision, you know, from a, a values perspective. But you know, by and large, um, when you say value, social values, you're, yeah, you're from a you know an environmental perspective. But you know, you also look at a lot of vehicles that we have out on the road, the cruise diesel. Uh, you know, people. Uh, again, will tell us they're getting over 50 miles to gallon on the, with the cruise diesel. So there's so much technology where you can be responsible from an environmental perspective. But I think what's important from the Volt's perspective is the continuing uh, drive right. to have more efficiency with the battery. Just take us though inside the room, when, and, and, and not to belabor the point, when you guys look out and you, you, you say to yourself, okay, oil prices are here, here, more people are going to buy SUVs. We need to either produce more SUVs now, or we need to produce more of this. Or how do you do that, and how do you model out uh, energy and oil prices? How do, you, how do you even think about that as a company? Well, you know, in addition to just the consumer buying trends, what's uh, across the globe, whether you're in China, uh, Brazil, Europe, North America, there's also fuel economy standards, CO2 standards, CAFE right. standards. And so you've got to look at the long term. And again, what we, we know what oil prices are now. We don't know how long they'll be. But again, I can tell you, it doesn't change our agenda of the investment and the R&D that we need to do 
for 357 and beyond. And so it, it doesn't really change that. I mean, clearly we'll look to, to see what does the market want today and make sure that we're adjusting. And we have flexibility in our capacity to do that. But again, longer term, and I think the more important agenda, it doesn't change it. Um, how much in-car technology, if you will, can the consumer actually handle? It, it feels like sometimes you get into these cars now and they, they, they go by themselves, which by the way may be a great thing, but they don't totally go by themselves yet. Right. Well, again, I think in our perspective, I mean, in the past General Motors, sometimes I think we've done technology for technology's sake. But right now, the, the filter that we put everything through is what's going to truly add value to the customer? What's going to be intuitive? What's going to make them more efficient, uh, allow them to do things? under you know, the broader umbrella of not creating driver distraction. But if you look at the technologies in the vehicles today, they're dramatically improving the safety and operation and, and interaction. Uh, they're, they are improving efficiency. I think we can do better, but I think we are at the early stages, and I think the customer can in, embrace a lot of technologies if it's executed well. What is driving like in 10 years? Are we actually driving cars? I mean, not that we're not driving cars. Are we actually driving them? Well, in, in, in 2016, we'll have a vehicle on the road that while you're on highways at speed and in, in bumper to bumper, you can take your hands and feet off. Uh, completely. Hands, completely. You still have to stay alert, and we're going to use some pretty um, unique technologies that we're not sharing yet on how we keep you engaged in the driving process. I think we're on that journey uh, to, um, to, to have more autonomous. I still think people want to drive. I mean, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday, and there's, uh, you know, uh, I think we get frustrated when we're you know, stopped in traffic, but there still is a joy of driving, and you're still going to need to get to point A to point B. But I think there will be more and more um, autonomous. I don't know if it's 10 years or not, because to truly make autonomous work, A, the customer has to value it. B, you have to have the technologies. But it, it's something the whole industry has to do together. That's why we announced that we have the v first V2V v vehicle that I'm aware of that will also come out in 16. The vehicles need to communicate. There needs to be money put into infrastructure. Many other countries around the globe are starting to do that already. So th there's a lot that has to come together to make that work safely. How much, do, it would go, on the safety issue, how much do you worry though about this idea that the driver doesn't have to pay as much attention to, to actual driving? and that then we're going to have to alert them to become more attentive again, and that ultimately becomes this sort of vicious circle. Well, I think you're not giving the customer enough credit. I mean, I think people are pretty smart. And again, if it's well designed, if it's intuitive, I think, you know, I think it can right. work. And I, but, I, but I think you can't underestimate how important it is to integrate the technology well, have it seamless, but then also, it's fine, you know, again, the technology that we're putting out is on the expressway. Uh, think about all the, think about the streets of New York City. And think about the, you know, errant dog that's off the leash and running. I mean, you gotta, you gotta think through all those aspects. So there's a lot of work, but it, it's clearly possible. In terms of finding engineers to do all of this work, you are competing effectively against Silicon Valley. How is that, how is that competition going? For talent. Uh, well, you know, first of Given all, historically, I, the amount of money yeah. that they've had relative right. to Detroit. Right. Uh, you know, first of all, I, I do believe very strongly there's a, a going to be a global shortage of technical talent. That's why I'm such a proponent of STEM, especially in the middle schools. It's one of my passions. Uh, but you know, I would say um, there's a lot that drives people to come to jobs. It's you know, what's the career? You know, how rewarding is it? How empowered are they? You know, are they respected? We actually do a lot of work uh, with our employees from a workplace of choice around the globe and um, measure that, actively work on it. It's something I review on a regular basis. So I believe attracting and keeping the talent is twofold. One, rewarding work. But I would also tell you, you know, there's some engineers, even through, I'll say, some of the most difficult times at GM, came to GM because they wanted to work on vehicles, on engines, on powertrains. So I think there's a lot of people where it's in their blood. Right. Uh, let me ask you a, la a labor-oriented question, mm -hmm. uh, probably less related to the engineers that you're hiring and more to um, some of the union workers. GM, Ford, Chrysler negotiated what's considered a two-tier uh, wage system for the union workers in the, in the UAW contract. Um, how does that work in reality? I mean, on the floor, does it, does it work? And does GM need a lower wage for entry-level workers to be competitive still with the foreign automakers? I think it's it's looking at a blended wage is the way we look at it, and I would say it is working. Uh, 
there's, I think there's areas that we can improve it, but I mean, the main, the main message is we have to be competitive. I mean, if there's anything we learned over the last five years is if long-term we're not competitive, it's not good for anyone because if the industry is not there, uh, it, you know, there is no job at any, at any tier. So, uh, you know, I think the main message, and, and, you know, when I look at it and how we work with our unions, it's how do we creatively problem solve to make sure we're understanding their issues and our issues come together. We're going to find a solution. Why not find it earlier? Um, another question related to employees and how employees think about it. In an age now where we've had this crisis and there are lots of other crises to cut everything, the, the federal government now appears likely to impose what I imagine are going to be harsher fines and possibly, you know, criminal penalties on automakers. And that has been talked about. Is it fair to the industry and how, how do you think it changes the dynamic inside a company like yours? Well, I, I don't know if it, it's right to comment on fair. I guess, you know, my whole goal and how we're driving the whole organization, first of all, you know, really engaging the employees. We've changed processes. We've changed validation processes to truly drive to a zero safety defect and then a zero defect vehicle. And that everything we're doing is on that path. So, you know, I want to be in a position where that's not a, that's not the dialogue because, you know, we're doing the right thing. We have the right and appropriate respect and, and uh, relationship with our regulators. And we're seen as part of the solution and doing the right thing. That that's that's the conversation. I will tell you, we're having that with every employee around the globe. What are the other? What are, what are the other conversations with the CEOs of the other automakers? What, what has that been like? What do they say? Uh, you know, I really haven't had that many on you know on the specific issue. Uh, you know, that the the crisis we face. I mean, we've talked about a lot of other issues, but haven't haven't really had those dialogues. Um, we haven't touched on China, mm -hmm. and I wanted to understand your view on where GM stands in China. And do you ever envision a day when the company can build cars there without a Chinese partner? Um, you know, I, the, the structure that we have right now, we have a very good relationship with our partner, SAIC. We've been, you know, partnered with them for well over a decade. Um, I think we're actually writing new, or uh, plowing new ground on how well we work together and what we're looking at. Um, so. China is incredibly important. It's it's a it's a, a large market. It's going to be a larger market. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about the growth in China. Is it slowing? I mean, even if you have instead of double digit, then single, high digit. If you go to mid digit growth, it's still very valuable growth. And General Motors is well positioned there. Uh, with Cadillac is just starting to emerge as a luxury brand. It's getting great uh, receptivity. We have strength with the Buick brand and with Chevrolet, um, putting very important SUVs in market. I, I see a lot of opportunity in China. I was just there about a month and a half ago. And again, so I look at it as the partner is seen as, as an, an advantage in, and how we're working together and, and what we're putting into the marketplace. Uh, back to the US for, for a moment, uh, auto loans. There's been a lot of articles about a potential bubble in the auto loan business. The Federal Reserve came out and said that if you looked at credit scores, uh, I, th I think they said uh, that there's been a huge number. It's nearly doubled uh, the credit scores uh, below 660. Uh, since 2009. Are you worried about that? You know, we have our own uh, GM Financial, which we're continuing to grow, and that was a, a business that we bought shortly after, uh, I think it was in the, the 10, 10, uh, 9 10 time frame. And I think they're very responsible in how they manage that process, and, and their, the, their stats and record as you look at it is very good. So, you know, I think we've got to be mindful of it. We've got to make sure we're responsible. But um, again, it's something we watch very closely. I personally look at, and I have a lot of faith in the GMF management team. I have a final question for you, I think. Uh, there's a piece in the New Yorker. I don't know if you read this. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry to surprise you with this if you haven't read it, um, where they used a, a, a term called a glass cliff. Have you heard about this? I have. The you have? And, and for those out there uh, who don't, uh, it, you know, it's basically a play on the glass ceiling. Uh, and this idea that women have been promoted into in certain positions uh, that have landed in crisis, and then it's, it, what do you, what, did you, did you read this piece? I've, I don't know if I've read the specific one you're referring to. I've read some. But what, what do you think of that idea? I, I think it's, um, I, it somewhat amuses me because I, I don't know if any company is that good that they can select somebody knowing they have a crisis and do that. I mean, so I don't know if any company especially can be that good. Um, so, and, and, and frankly, I think it, um, you know, I, I, I think it doesn't respect the, the work that women have done to get to the roles they've had and how they've earned them, what, and men or women. So, you know, I, I, it was a play on a glass ceiling comment, but I, I thought it was flawed. Okay. Uh, we're going to leave it. Thank you for coming and, sure. and answering Thank these you. questions so candidly. We really, really appreciate it. Thank Goodness, you. Nice to see you. It's been great to see you. Thank you.
Thank you.